welcome to the lecture. My name is Dash. I'll probably introduce myself in just a little bit. Um, just a quick bit about HR Notes. Um, first of all, welcome to the lecture. Um, now, since 2007, here at HR Notes, we've been offering free resources, just like this video, um, to make sure that students can really not just survive their studies, but actually thrive in them, right? Um, and lectures like this have been offered since 2015. Now, the, the reason we offer, you know, free lectures and other free resources that I, as a student myself, use all of these um, is because it's in line with our mission to help students as much as possible. And, you know, that's why there's tons of resources out there, okay? Easily accessible online. Um, I know probably the one that most of you guys have seen is probably the ATAR calc. I love jump. I love jumping on there, seeing where I'm tracking, and that actually helped inform my subject decisions because I was like, oh no, you know, psychology won't scale as well as like methods or specialists, right? Um, but there's also Q and A, piece of articles, um, freely written by you know elite grads who've done it all before. They know what they're talking about. Study notes um, and also free videos as well. Um, p potentially, this is your first interaction with ATAR notes, so um, hop on these before there's externals, because we do know they're coming up. Um, so yeah, if you go to atarnotes.com, um, you can find heaps and heaps of stuff. Have a bit of a wander around. Um, besides free resources, um, one thing I did, this is how I started interacting with ATAR notes and became a tutor here was actually ATAR Notes Plus. So there was this really good deal for like three months and I got it like um, kind of this time of the year last year and everyone else did as well because we were like, well, you know, where are we gonna get our practice exams from? But, you know, you do it for the practice exams, but then you get these complete course notebooks which you can write the summary pages off um, and then flashcards and stuff that is so content heavy like biology. There's also good text guides because I'm not very good at English. Um, but having a text guide that someone's already anal analyzed it for you kind of just makes you that little bit more informed. Um, cannot recommend enough. I personally, you know, <laughs> as a student got the like three monthly, you know, a subscription for three months and I found it immensely useful. I mean, you need volume of top of test, especially for math, especially for chemistry and where else do you get it, to be honest. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've got free notes, videos, free guides from past students, that's all available online. Um, and then if, if you do want extra support, make sure you sign up for ATAR Notes Plus. Like I said, I do have personal experience with that one. All right, now, welcome to the methods lecture. Um, now, this is kind of a probability type wrap up. Um, that's what we're mostly gonna focus on. Um, kind of rounding up unit four because you've been taught all that content now. This should make a fair amount of sense, okay? I will still explain it quite simply, but you want this to kind of be making sense just by the fact that, you know, we're, we've hit holidays now and the external exams aren't that far away. So this is a really nice revision tool where you can kind of go, okay, I know that, I know that. And if you don't know something, maybe you play that that part of the video two or three times, okay? Uh, if there's a formula you need to memorize, I will print it out. Um, I'll, I'll do my best to kind of relate my lived experience having sat that external last year um, and, and done well. Um, so this is my proper introduction. My name is Dash. I'm a first year medical student up at JCU um, in Cairns. So I graduated last year from Redland State College um, with an ATAR 99.15. Um, as you can imagine, you know, to get an ATAR that high, you have, to, you have to do methods, you have to do specialists. I didn't do physics, um, so I had like bio as my other one, and, and chems. And for methods, I got 49 on the internals and 48 on the external exam, which I was super duper happy with. Now, I will note last year's external exam was definitely the hardest. That's that's not my bias. That's um, cat like... Um, I've heard from the teachers all have like this page and they basically said, wow, what the heck, that was so hard. Um, so it was hard and that's because they're trying to kind of protect the scaling. If you did specialist, you would have found it a fair bit easier because there was a genuine just like specialist question that was in there. 
but it kind of highlighted to me, like if I was just a method student, that you kind of need really strong breadth as well as depth. Because yeah, all well and good, you can do you can do that one question really well, but you kind of needed the breadth of knowledge. Like we had a um, simultaneous Bayesian log question that popped up last year. Um, to date, I haven't met anyone else who's solved that question. It was really really hard. Um, and that, you know, I, I don't even know if I specifically revise it, okay, rearrange the log equations, no. Um, and sometimes that happens. But importantly, you do get part marks, so give it your best shot, and you will do better than you think. Um, just a little fun fact about me. I love running. Great way to ease the stress. Um, I've run several marathons, um, and one ultra marathon was only 50k, so it's not really, like, a big one. But um yeah i i did that to try and prove that i could <laughs> all right let's get into it um how this is basically going to work we've got a two-hour lecture um there's going to be two main blocks of content and we have a bit of randomizer vision that i'm going to throw in there if you've got questions this isn't live but i will be sitting in the live chat right now um so please ask away whatever it is content uni whatever it's about um, maybe you you know sniffing through a question you're like oh how do I do this or um, you're interested in what review resources specifically I use for my methods revision it's cool ask away I'm in the live chat so go for it you can always rewatch the video um, and then yeah so if you see a question that's like yours make sure to upload it um, and then well we've kind of shown you the the resources so far um, to be honest. It, it is kind of comprehensive what Aton Oaks Plus does. So I did, wasn't getting anything else besides Aton Oaks Plus um, for my external study. Um, and as we know, methods is all about those practice exams. All right, so we've got three topics. Sorry, I'll just briefly introduce them. First, we're doing kind of the miscellaneous things in Unit 4. Um, firstly, second derivative number three. Um, some of it. All of it potentially is revision for you from year 11 and year 10, but if it's not, no problem, we'll go through it properly. Uh, topic two, kind of probability basics, and then we move on to normal probability. Um, it'll kind of, um, I know those, it's basically just part one, part two probability. Probability is very broad, and there's several subtopics in each one of those topics. All right, topic one, the second derivative and trigonometry. So, as we kind of learned at the end of year 11 and revised, uh, what you would have had to for your I1, sorry, I2, there's a few different rules we use for differentiation. Firstly, we have the power rule, product rule, quotient, and chain. Now, all three, or all four rather, th these are all on your formula book. So, don't be worried, don't be scared, you know, frantically writing this down. Um, this is just me recapping. Um, but the real kind of extension to this, which is what, what is being taught, taught in Unit 4, uh, is the second derivative. So the second derivative is useful for several things, because mathematically it has this property where um, it's like acceleration. That, that's the best example you can think of. So car's moving. Um, how fast is the car moving? Meters per second? Well, that's going to be velocity. But then... How is that speed going to go up or down? The acceleration tells us that, right? That means that the acceleration is the second derivative of the displacement vector, okay? Um, so knowing your differentiation, you've done it to death by this point, um, but knowing your differentiation is important. Uh, do not neglect it, and when you see it, like you might just get a question, it's like, oh, what's the derivative of this? Don't just rush over it and you know, get onto that hard um, probability question of combining multiple types of probability. Actually stop and think about it, because too many people, even for specialists, will say, oh, and they get the, like, these marks, which should be the easy, like, lock this in, you know, this is going to help you pass. They miss those marks because they will do, like, integration. It's such an easy mistake to make, like, you're like, oh, Especially if you've been doing lots of integration questions, kind of just looks the same, you go and do it, and it, you feel so stupid. And you're not stupid. 
your mind's just working a bit too quickly. So take the time and slow down in the exam. It's okay. You're not going to run out of time. You can get it done in the time. So if we have a function f of x, this is just a bit of notation. Um, if we find the derivative of that function, we, we usually say um, f dash x, uh, f, f apostrophe x. Um, <laughs> that's the first derivative. The second derivative, f apostrophe apostrophe x. Um, third derivative, f apostrophe 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 x. You can see that these apostrophes just mean derivative. Um, and so on, we can, we can keep going, but usually we just talk about the first derivative and the second derivative, um, and the second derivative the first der is the derivative of the first derivative. So we just have to do differentiation twice. So the second derivative is actually the one, well, the reason it, it can be useful is that it tells us more about the shape of the graph than just the first derivative alone. So the first derivative, while great, doesn't really get us the depth, it's the second derivative that we use um, to kind of tell us a little bit more. We would have talked extensively about this in, in unit three, stationary points, and the nature of a stationary point. Um, I'm sure you're probably pretty sick of them. If not, and you're like, what did he just say? Go back, watch the video for unit three, give yourself a bit of a refresher, and it's it's not too complicated, so you will you will understand it having looking by looking at it again. Okay, <clears throat> so the first derivative gives us the rate of change. Okay, that is a core principle. First derivative is the rate of change. But then, what does the second derivative give us? And it may sound confusing, but it's actually the rate of change of the rate of change, which sounds like a bunch of gibberish, but in essence, it's like is it, gonna, it actually tells us whether um, the first function is going to go up or it's going to go down, okay? Whereas if we just had velocity, that's not going to be quite so useful to us, okay? And velocity would, or speed would be an example of the first derivative. Yeah, exactly. So the slope of a function is going to, whether the slope is going to become more positive or negative. Here is a nice illustration because Having a strong um, kind of graphical understanding of things is super, super, super duper important, especially for math. So if we look, we've got these stationary points. So this, this is just the displacement vector, uh, or rather, this is, this is just f of x, okay? Nothing fancy here, no derivatives or anything crazy. This is just a function, okay? Um, could not tell you, well, we got one, two, three. It could be cubic. Um, because we've got 3x in the set. Maybe. Who knows? No, I'm pretty sure it's cubic. <laughs> um, now, if we look at these two stationary points, although um, the first derivative is both 0 here, that tells us nothing. That just says that, oh, yeah, it re reaches either a min or a max, which isn't actually that useful, because it doesn't tell us, like, if we had to draw it based off this, that's not going to tell us whether it's going to go up, down, what's going to happen? So what we would do is then find the, um, the, the second derivative. So the first derivative here um, at this, this maximum point here would be 0. But the second derivative would be negative because it's a max point. And essentially, think of the negative as if it's about to go down. Like it's hit its maximum point. Second der derivative is, is negative, which means that the graph is actually going to go down after that, down negative. Um, conversely, if we look at this point here, this is another stationary point. So this would be a, um, a minimum. And the first derivative is once again going to be 0. But if we um, do like a second derivative test, the second derivative here will be positive. Why is it positive? Because it's about to go up after that. So this is kind of just a, you know, a way you can graphically map it. And QCAA has asked questions in the past where they'll be like, oh, you know, this is, you don't, they won't even give you values. They'll just be like, the first derivative is positive here, negative, positive, negative, whatever, something like that. Now draw the graph, roughly. And if there's no scale, it doesn't matter where you draw it, you just draw it, okay? Um, <clears throat> and so you have to have a strong graphical understanding and understand, you know, second derivative, negative, it's a maximum, first derivative, zero, it's a stationary point, um, 
etc etc all right <clears throat> so if the second derivative is greater than zero i.e it's positive guess what it's concave up it's going to go up it's like a little smiley face you know things things are going to get better um so we're going to be smiling um next we have if it's decreasing that means it's concave down so it's a yeah no that minimum if it if it's and this is where we kind of have this little bit of a um confusing you know it seems to contradict a bit because it's like a minimum is concave up and you got to remember you got to think like okay we've hit rock rock bottom and it's now going to get better should we be smiling of course we should be it's going to get better and um likewise um you know if we're at our peak probably not going to be pretty happy if if we know we've peaked that means we're going to go down okay now it's like the stock market if you see it it's, it's at a peak and you should have sold all the way back here but then it starts falling you're like oh no you would you would be uh not smiling that's for sure so um having that strong graphical understanding is really important concave up smiley face concave down frowny face um now we have this other kind of scenario which is when it's the second derivative is exactly zero now if the second derivative is exactly zero we think we're saying likely it's point of inflection now i think i've done one question where it wasn't a point of inflection it was super duper weird i think it would be very mean for them to ask that when this is the topic where they want students who are potentially going to struggle to pass to be able to um, conceptualize this great pass based off that okay because they want everyone to pass um so i really would find it unlikely that we have the weird obscure case they're probably gonna um test like a probability question over something like this or optimization it's probably a better thing to test <clears throat> So yeah, it's likely a POI point of inflection, well, which tells us that the shape itself is about to, about to change. Um, and then it, it's kind of point of inflection is a more weird. You you cover them extensively in unit three, <clears throat> kind of where it goes from concave up to concave down. Um, and if you think about it, it's like well, if you were to graph the second derivative, second derivative is negative. There's this brief instant hit zero and then it goes positive. That brief instant where it's zero is this inflective point. It's where we're actually changing over, okay? All right, what are some applications? Why is this important? Going back to what I said before, <clears throat> position, velocity, and acceleration. Position vectors are also known as displacement. Uh, velocity, also known as speed. So if the position of something in a straight line is given by xt, um, so x being displacement, T, that's the like um, independent, no, not um, independent variable. Yeah, uh, it's the it's what we would usually think of x, so like y equals mx plus b or whatever. That x is now a t, so they use a little bit weird notation. Um, but if we find the derivative of x t, that's going to be velocity. Then if we find the second derivative of x t by differentiating v t we're going to have acceleration, <clears throat> okay? And this is what we were talking about before, right? Um, now, I will note um, just something that popped up in my head. I did stuff this up the first time I did it. Um, if we are doing a displacement vector, <clears throat> if the value is negative, it's going to go to the left. If it's positive, it's going to go to the right. Now, the reason I say that, because you're like, uh, yeah, duh, of course, it's physically left and right on the graph. You actually lose a mark if you don't say um, whether it's gone left or right. Because the question, you know, how far has it gone? Where has it gone? And you're like, oh, it's gone 15 meters. It's easy. No worries. I'm jumping on to the next question. You just lost um, half a mark <coughs> for absolutely nothing. Um, so make sure you say left and right. So in your little therefore statement there, you say, therefore, it's gone 15 meters left or 15 meters right. Okay? Super, super, duper important. I do not want you losing marks for stuff that you damn well know. All right, <clears throat> so understanding this relationship means if you know one of these functions, you can unpack a lot of useful information about the system. What does that mean? 
If you know the velocity vector or the velocity equation, you're going to be able to find the displacement or the acceleration. All right, here's an example question. So the position x of a particle after t seconds is given by the function xt equals 4 minus cos um, pi t divided by 4 um, between 0 and 8 minutes. Question A, find the function for the acceleration of the particle. Then B, find the times at which the particle is not moving. C, find the times at which the particle is not accelerating. Um, classic question, simple familiar, sorry, not anything too difficult here. Now, pause the video, take five minutes, um, because, because this is kind of in revision, right? These are just extra practice questions for you. Have a go, uh, if you can't get it, that's fine. Um, I'm gonna kind of step through it. I can't write it out physically, but I'll kind of explain to you the answer. There will be an answer on this next page. So pause the video. All right. So firstly, um, we've got that function. To find the, the function for the acceleration, the acceleration is the second derivative of the displacement vector or the displacement equation. So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna use our differentiation rule to find first the velocity, and then we're gonna turn that into an acceleration vector. So, three lines are lurking here. First, what's the go? Well, this four, they're using power rule here, and they're using like the full working out. You don't need to write four times t to the power of zero. Um, that's kind of like, like we get that. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we don't need to know that. And you just know that if it doesn't have a t in it, we don't care. We just get rid of that entirely. Then we have minus four cos pi t on four. Now, you know that the derivative is, of cos is, is sine and then you just pull the one over a, you know the, you just pull the a value out to the front. Um, that is a um, king rule by pattern. Now you do need to know the by pattern rule because yes, potentially you could be doing, you know, chain rule in an exam, but it takes way too long. I do not recommend you do that. I have friends who did that. It was not very clever. Um, <clears throat> but also with integration, you're not going to be able to, there's no chain rule for integration that you get taught in, in methods. So you're, you're actually going to have to, um, you're, you're, you're going to have to have learned those by pattern rules. Okay. Um, that's just a little tangent, not an actual tangent, but you're, you're going to, you're going to have to look at those and make sure you've memorized them. If you've done the correct quantity of questions that you should, you will know them off by heart just because you've used them that many times. But for now, don't don't worry if you're still looking them up because you will pick it up across time, okay? Now, we know cos goes to sine. Is there a little negative in there? Well, <clears throat> I couldn't tell you because all you do is you just go to the data booklet. The data booklet's there for a reason. Um, the formula sheet, please, please, please don't neglect it. It's right there. They're going to give it to you. Click open, oh, it's it's positive um, sign, or negative, actually. <clears throat> so we pull the A value out to the front. The A value um, is this thing times T, so pi on 4. Now, if we pull pi on 4 out the front, the 4s cancel, and it just becomes pi, like over here. Um, there's also a negative, so then we switch from cos to sine due to the derivative. There's a little negative that cancels out that negative that was already there. So we're left with this um, pi sine pi t on 4. Note the thing in the brackets, just that stays for it. Like we could do a bazillion derivatives, that's going to stay the same. <clears throat> then we do the whole thing again, and that's to find the acceleration, which is the second derivative. So we just take the derivative of the first derivative. Pull out the a value again, a value pi on 4. Um, then we get this pi squared divided by 4. Um, then we find the derivative of sine, which is positive cos. Awesome. And as you can see, nice cancelling. C, find the times at which the particle is not moving. So if the particle is moving, it has speed. It has velocity. It's moving. But if it's not, that means the speed is going to be zero. So it's not moving at all. Um, so what we're going to do, actually, is just sub in velocity, speed, equals zero. We solve for that. Um, now, this is a potentially tech-free question. Um, it'd be a bit rough, but, but it is potentially tech-free. Um, 
Um, you could use a calculator, of course, but um, if we put zero here, if we strike off that pi, we get zero because we just divide zero by pi, and all of a sudden we've got zero equals sine pi on four t. <coughs> now, because we're talking about sine, what we do is we make zero into a oh, when does um when does sine equal zero at zero at two pi at well at zero at pi at two pi at three pi four pi five pi etc etc so we got sine zero or two pi or three pi etc etc equals sine pi on four t then what you can do is you can strike off the sines so that we're left with um, <clears throat> basically pi on 4t equals either 0, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, etc. Okay, and then what we do is we have um, pi on 4t equals um, pi, 3 pi, etc, etc. We then multiply out the 4, divide out the pi, and then we're left with t equals 0, 4, 8, etc, etc. Okay? Um, you could probably also work it out by like going, okay, what's the period and kind of logicking it out like that. But I like that algebraic way. This has been done tech active, but that is a tech free skill. And that's why I've kind of taken the time to explain what you would actually have to do in that scenario. Okay. If you have, if you want me to kind of step that out a bit more, I know I just said it out loud, so it's a bit sucky, but, um, just, just let me know in the chat and I'll, I'll just quickly type it out while you guys are watching and then you can see exactly what I mean. All right, <clears throat> part C, we're trying to find when the particle is not accelerating. So, when it's not accelerating, the acceleration vector is going to be equal to zero. We let, let the acceleration vector equal zero. <clears throat> then, once again, we have this. Now, if you use nsolve on the calculator or whatever your numerical solve function is, happy days. But um, if this is a tech for exam, you're not going to have that luxury. So, what we do is we strike out we divide the zero by pi squared over four. Then we're left with zero equals cos pi on four t. When does cos equal zero? Cos equals zero, remember that's the x one. Um, it equals zero at um, pi on half. It also equals zero at three pi on two, uh, and so on. So you go back around and go, okay, two pi plus pi on two, which is, um, 5 pi on 2, and you just keep going. Now, that means that cos pi on 2 equals cos pi on 4t. We cross out the coses, and we're left with pi on 2 equals pi on 4 times t. We divide out the pi on 4, so pi on 2 divided by pi on 4. Um, we have to flip it. It's going to be um, 2. Yes. Um, and then we're going to have t equals 2, and then you do it again for when cos is down here, and it's also equal to 0 because that's the x-axis, um, and that's going to be at 3 pi on 2. If you also do that, you're going to find it 6. And once again, if, if, if that doesn't make sense to you, I'm visualizing it, but if you can't, um, I'll just type it out in the chat. So apologies, it's not on the slides, but that is a tech-free skill you do need to have. <clears throat> All right, so a lot of problems are going to... But they're going to really like that you find a minimum or maximum. Um, now, it might not say that. It might just be like, optimization, and you have to figure it out. Or it won't even tell you. It'll be, oh, no, it, it will probably tell you, like, oh, find the maximum volume or um, whatever. And that's, that's how you know. So it's actually pretty easy to do using the second derivative. This is how we optimize it, because we just find the top point, and that's optimized. We've got the best bang for our buck, and um, we win. <laughs> um, so some examples, you know, find the greatest volume of a cylinder with a set surface area, or find the optimum number of t-shirts a manufacturer should produce to maximize profit. That's a nice one, because finance is a little, like, forgotten topic that does, like, slip in. Um, I honestly forget what objective it is, but um, it is, like, you know, knowing that profit equals revenue minus losses that that's important or minus expenses so you know they could link those two things up to make a question who knows you know they they, they have a great variety of questions that they do ask 
or find the time at which tides will be at their lowest. That was something that they really loved talking about in year 11. Bit at year 12 as well, um, but also um, because the tides will be like a cosine or sine graph, there's better ways to work it out. Like you can kind of just um, eyeball it or you know graph it, and it's kind of more effective. Now I will note that a lot of students will actually leave marks as well for um, questions where you used your graphics calculator and you found the answer by doing like the maximum point, but you didn't draw a graph. If you use your calculator graphically and you use like the max function, you have to write using calculator max function, and you also have to draw the graph. It's really annoying, but otherwise you're going to lose that mark, and that one really sucked. Otherwise, just do it algebraically. You might find it a bit quicker. I hated drawing. I, I really suck at drawing, so. Um, but yeah. All right, that's set the second derivative. Apologies, we don't have many questions there. Um, optimization was covered extensively in year 11. Um, once you understand the general process, it's kind of just rinse and repeat. Once you work out the two equations and do your substitution, you can kind of bluff your way from there. It's a complex topic, however, once you got it, you got it. So with that being said, do high volume and practice questions for that one, because if you're not getting it right, you're missing out on three marks. All right, without further ado, let's get on to trig. These are the basics. So you will have prior knowledge because you did your um, prep all the way up to year 11, okay? Now, the basics are Sokotoa, so sine equals opposite over hypotenuse, uh, cosine equals adjacent over hypotenuse, tan equals opposite over adjacent. Not really, like they love to ask questions where you draw a little triangle in specialist, but for methods it was less common. Um, there is an extra rule that you should appreciate though, or an extra two, and that is that tan equals y on x, or sine on cos. Now, you don't need to understand the proof for that necessarily. If not, there's a great chapter um, in the Complete Course Notes book. Um, I was recently teaching a student in Year 11 from that, actually, and they found it really useful. Um, so sine is also equal to y, so y equals sine. Cos equals x. Um, so when you're actually looking at the unit circle, the x component is cos theta. The y component is sine theta. Tan theta equals y divided by x. And the reason that that works is it's just Sokotoa, except the hypotenuse is one, and so it simplifies to like sine equals y, and that's and that's because the the um the radius of the circle is always going to be one for a unit circle. That's the definition of a unit circle. Anyway, and then we have these kind of like a little bit more confusing rules, just like 180 degree minus theta is sine theta. 180 minus theta is negative cos theta, and you're like, what the heck, I never learned that, that's so confusing. Basically, it's just saying that if you flip um, something, so we have sine, and we flip it, it has to do with the y and the x, so whether it becomes positive or whether it becomes negative. Um, now, I do think it's important, you know, the cast rule, so C, A, F, T, start in that bottom right quadrant, go C, A, F, T. Um, and that's just to know whether the value you're going to get is positive or negative. That's kind of what this is alluding to. Um, so the cast rule is quite useful because, you know, if we, you, you have an uh, angle that's not in the first quadrant, you're going to be like, what the heck? Um, and even though it's going to be the same value, whether that's square root 2 on 2, et cetera, those are your exact values, you do have to memorize them. Um, whether it's triangles or you just memorize the table, I did the table. Um, now, if it's outside of that, you have to go, okay, I know it's going to be that um, number, so square root 2 on 2 or whatever, because of, it's just a reference angle, so it can't exceed that. However, you have to then, it might be negative. So you found a positive number, but C, A, F, T, if it's negative in that quadrant, all you do is you put it on negative. This last part, congruence ten, test, um, Congruency, similarity, not really that useful. Uh, however, it's pretty easy. It's just like side, side, side. So if they've got three same sides, they're, they're congruent. Side, angle, side. Um, so two sides and an angle, or two angles and... Which is, um, so right 
we need a right angle for that. So it's actually just side. Sorry, just putting this in. It's actually that we have a right angle in there. Now, sidewalk. This is on your data book, so don't worry about too much. But also, so you have sine A divided by A equals sine B divided by B. You can swap that. It, it doesn't matter because you're swapping both sides. You can swap that at any given point in time. Um, that that can be useful because otherwise you have to do a little bit harder math. But if you see that on the formula sheet, you can just um, flip it when you write it on your paper. That's good. Um, also, a pretty basic rule that you do have to know is that all of the interior angles, so A, C, and B, those all add up to 180. That's part of the definition of a triangle. All right, so for the triangle ABC, find the angle BAC. Now, um, you have five minutes, so pause the video again, have a go, it should be fairly easy, but that's like it depends on how much work you you did back in like year 10 or 11 for me my teachers really stressed it because it comes up in year 12 for you they may not have um and that's okay that's why we do it at this introductory level and then we move on to more complex examples a bit later so um have a go um sometimes you can get mm, anyway we'll see all right let's head on to the intro so if we're finding bac BAC means the angle between, so we've got point B, point C, and then A. B, A, it's the angle that's formed between B and C where they meet at A, okay? So that's this guy up here. Now, we have to use that 180 rule that we literally just talked about. They all add up to 180, so we just minus away the 32 and the 78. Hey, presto, we get angle BAC, also known as angle A. Um, for find the value of C, um, we have to use sine rule, okay? Now, they may have just asked us straight away, okay, find the value of C, and we would have had to use part A to then solve for it, okay? Sometimes slightly harder questions get you to do that, which is once again why I recommend high volume of questions. I know you've got access to text scores. Do enough questions of that so that um, until you, your eyes hurt and you, you already know all the stuff and like you're so bored because you're getting it right each time. That's good. All right, so you all you do is you just sub in what you know, solve for what you don't know, okay? Um, the, big, the big letters are for angles, the small ones are for sides. Right. Then our next rule that we have, this rule is also given by, um, it's also given by the formula sheet, so don't worry too much about this, and that is c squared equals a squared plus b squared minus 2ab plus cos c. How do I know what cos c is? Or no, how do I know what c is? You can actually make c the one that you're interested in. No, you make c the one where you know the angle and you know the side, um, and then a and b, those can be your variables. Um, you can rearrange this one. It's not set in stone, even though they may say that a is the one you're solving for or whatever, you can swap it around and do whatever you like, okay? It, it doesn't matter. And then if you give them three sides, could use that formula, um, but I've honestly never seen that before in my life, so I really doubt you'll need that for an external exam. <laughs> um, for the quadrilateral, quadrilateral, qu quad means four, so um, we there's a couple of properties of these guys, basically it's like we can draw a a line between P and R here, and that's gonna give us two triangles, which can help sometimes. Um, now this one's a little bit harder, so um, you you can have 10 minutes if you want. I try and whip through it pretty quick because you want to save that time for some of the harder harder algebraic questions potentially you can get um, uh, later on in the exam. So pause the video, have a go. Um, all right, here's the answer. So for part A, we had to find the length of PR. That That's between P and R, and it's actually going to help you with the, the, the next couple of questions, okay? Um, now, to find the length of PR, we let PR be C. Now, the reason we let it be C is because the angle of interest is 102. So that would be PSR. Um, 
and it's actually like opposite so they do this weird thing where it's like angle s is opposite to its side so it's like um think of it like opposite to track okay um and that's why mathematically it's like the the one that's opposite is the one that's also going to be the same letter okay we sub it in um you do have to do a little square root just some simple algebra it this is this would be a tech active question as these mostly are um part b find the angle prq so p q intersecting at r um for this one we're just going to use sine rule because um we have or we're, we're finding an angle because there's two angles involved Whenever there's two angles involved, we know that it, it, it's going to have to be sine rule. Whereas if there's only one involved, we can use cos, cos um, to solve. Okay. Um, so we sub it all in. Bit of rearranging. This one, once again, would be in your calculator. You have a fancy graphics calculator, so um, make sure you use it and check over your answers when you get all that free time at the end. You won't have that much free time, but um, it is a good opportunity to pick up because you'll find mistakes and, and you'll You'll, you'll earn extra points by um, going over your calculator and going, okay, I, I did that, I did that, sub that. Oh, what did I do there? All right, part C, find the length PS. Um, here, we're just using sine rule yet again, bit of rearranging, which is no problemo. Um, now, if, you're, if you ask for radians, that's fine. You would give your answer in radians. But because the question gives it in degrees, you're going to put it in degrees. Now, people get, like, people mess up big time. It's probably one of the biggest things where, like, it's a horror story, besides, like, not remembering to fill in those multi-choice bubbles, and that is they leave their calculator in one mode for the whole exam, which means they're in a lot of trouble with questions like this, where it's like, their workouts are perfect, they know what they're talking about. But they've got in radians, not degrees, and they're just missing that mark every single time. Every single time. Okay, so we just rearrange and make sure your calculator is in the right mode. Ah, area of a triangle. So, you've been taught from like year seven, eight, um, back when math was boring, that an area of a triangle is given by half times the base times the height. But, using trig, and you don't really need to know the why here, um, we can actually um, kind of figure out another rule. Now, I'm pretty sure this one's not on the formula sheet, um, I would have to double check. Uh, I'm not going to, but you could um, by just pulling up your data book. But if you can't see, area equals half BC times sine A. I'm pretty sure it is in there, actually. I'd say yes. Um, you might have to commit this one to memory. So write it down in your formula sheet, memorize it the night before, no worries. Um, and this is, now you can see that we're talking about B, we're talking about C, and then sine A. So we've got these two sides and then the angle that's not associated with those sides. So side, side, um, and then the angle here between those two sides that's not associated with those two sides because it's opposite to the other one. So um, A, the side A would be here, which is opposite to that angle. That's what I was talking about before. Um, and to work this out, all we need are two sides and an included angle. So it's arguably better than having to find the, the height of the triangle Often, you're going to have to use this rule um, to work it out. Now, don't be afraid in an exam to have to, you know, have a bit of a, you know, you, you look at a question, you're like, oh, God, for some reason, my mind's blank. That's fine. Everyone has that during an exam. And it doesn't mean you're going to do better, you're going to do worse. You know, it's going to happen regardless. So what's your coping mechanism when that happens? That's the more important thing that I want you to get out of today. And that is you pull up. You're, so you've got your formula sheet in your hand. You're, you're holding it in a, in, a, in a fist because, you know, you, this is important, right? Now, you see the question, you're like, gosh, I've done a bazillion of these questions. Why can't I think? What you do is you go to the formula sheet, which is like your cheat notes you got in the exam, pretty much. You flick through, and you find whatever formula mo looks the most relevant. Fortunately here, it's going to say area of a triangle. And even though you're thinking, oh, area of a triangle, oh, that was like, base height like why I, we don't have the the height here like how does that work you're gonna flick through you're gonna see this sine a formula and then you're gonna go oh we've been given an angle we've been given this we've been given that 
I'm going to be able to figure it out, okay? Don't be afraid to, um, you know, feel confused at times. That's okay. It's about how you deal with that confusion. All right, so here's an example. Um, once again, pause the video, have a go. Um, the answer is here. So if we're finding the area here, um, firstly, we're going to have to find an angle. So you would look it up on and you go, oh, I, don't, I don't have an angle. Um, I've only got three sides. Fortunately, you know that if you've got three sides, you can use the cos rule, sub in B, C, and A, and then solve for the cos A. All right? As you know, cos A is this guy here. So H would be little a. Big A, which is the angle, um, is going to be this guy over here. Okay? Once you've solved for that, all you do is you, you sub in the different values, so B, C, etc., uh, into the formula. And hey, presto, there's your area. Okay? So really easy marks, because this is pretty mark heavy, uh, relatively. Considering all you're doing is like um, using two different formulas that you don't, don't even have to memorize, and you're just directly subbing it in. It's pretty high yield, to be honest. Make sure you know this stuff. All right. So these are the complex familiar and unfamiliar applications that you may experience. Um, bearings coming from it. I hated bearings. So knowing that the true bearing is from north and then we go clockwise um, or, you know, east, south, all, all of this, um, north, east, south, west. Knowing that, you can kind of figure it out to an extent. But we will go through some of these questions in a bit. Um, and then angles of elevation and depression. Elevation, we're looking up. Depression, we're looking down. Um, that may just make intuitive sense to you. Um, problems in three dimensions is complex and familiar. Very high yield. Um, hasn't been asked for super a lot, which is why I think yours it may be asked because you have to have a pretty like spacey understanding to be able to do it, which does separate students quite significantly. We also can have, have like angles between planes. I forget whether when I wrote this, I was talking about um, planes as in planes or planes as in like, you know, different planes and because um, a plane is like a surface. But they do like planes questions where they have, um, you know, the, or this boat is moving this way, this is moving that way. Okay, when are they going to intersect? Are they going to intersect? Um, how do we look at that? Um, it can get quite complicated, quite convoluted. Fortunately, the textbook that your teacher has given you is very good at giving you convoluted questions. So look at that. And I'm sure you'll find some hard questions, which you can go over if you're like, mm, I feel like I haven't done enough practice on this. So we need to know those base rules. You need to have that understanding down pat before we can go into those questions. Okay? If you didn't get those ones before, maybe this next part is going to seem a bit tough. And you know why? Because you haven't got the basics yet. And that's fine. I just recommend maybe watching the first part again, looking on YouTube, looking at all the free resources you've got available, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so complex and familiar examples. Find the angle of C or um, C apostrophe. We're going to talk about what that means in a sec. A and D apostrophe. Then find the angle of um, of of that shape, uh, of that triangle rather. Um, and then we got these little variables. So as you can see, this question looks rough. We look at this and we're like, what the heck is going on? Um, and that's why it's complex and familiar. Super duper high yield, because once you know what you're doing, the marks aren't that hard. Like, conceptually, it's out there, but once conceptually you understand it, you know, um, it, it is high yield. It's good bang for buck. All right. So, first of all, what is going on? This diagram is a little bit better here, actually. Finding the angle. Um, also, so give yourself 10 minutes, I'd say, for this one, because it is a complex sense for you. Um, it's probably not whack. Like I, like, I call them whack questions where they're like, they're the external question that no one in the state gets. I don't think this is whack. It's quite doable. Um, but it is definitely complex and familiar, which means you get this, you're, you're scoring in the 80s, 90s. Alright, so find angle CAD, so, or C apostrophe to A. So th this apostrophe stuff is just to confuse you. C apostrophe to A to D apostrophe, which is over here. So basically like that in this kind of plane. All right, um, now we can find the length. Um, the length, th this is something that potentially could be worth 
um, kind of appreciating. Now, if not, how on earth did you figure this out? It's actually um, Pythag. I know. Oh, what's Pythag? Oh. Pythagoras theorem, c squared equals a squared plus b squared. Essentially, when we have these right angles, which, by the way, happen inside of a prism, this is a rectangular prism. That means we can use Pythag. Um, essentially, a to not to d apostrophe here. To find the length of ad here, we're going to add s, which is its, its like rise. We're going to square that plus 2x squared. But we're going to put a square root on that because we're looking for the hypotenuse. And we don't want c squared, we want c. So we're going to put a little square root there. That, that's how this derives. Um, that, that kind of working out here, if, if that makes sense. But if uh, you need further explanation, you know, could query away, please. No, I'll ask in the live chat, please. Um, yeah, so then they simplify. Fortunately, it does simplify fairly nicely. Um, and then they do that with AC as well. Um, and then we go, sorry, it's just been cut off a little bit. Come up here. Um, mm, kind of a bit lost to where this is from. That's just 20, square root 21 times s, because the square root of that is just s. Um, I think that's just an elaboration of that over there. Um, not sure what, what that line corresponds to. Um, yeah, okay, so now, now we've basically figured out these two things, okay? That's, we were figuring out AC, and we're figuring out AD. Why do we need to know that? Well, now we can use a sine or cosine rule. Now, if we've got two sides and a third, and we don't have an angle, what are you thinking? Probably cosine. Um, well, we could use cosine to find one of the angles. Um, but that being said, like there are different ways you can go about it. Here, they've, you know, I, I would have done the hard way, which would have been cosine, but you can also use sine because the angle C. BC is going to be a right angle, once again, just due to the nature of this prism that we're talking about here. Um, so we sub everything in, we've got X's. Um, fortunately, the X's actually cancel out. So if you were doing this question organically, um, you know, you'd be thinking, well, you know, how on earth are, are, you know, are we going to get rid of these X's? We haven't been give, given any more information. Fortunately, it just cancels out, which is why it's important not to try and like, oh, I don't know the... You know, I'm just looking at this question. I can't figure out the last line of working out. Oh, um, and then being really frustrated. Just work it out step by step. Do it sequentially. Whatever, you know, your only thought should be, okay, what do I think the next step is going to be? Because at worst, you're going to get five marks. Uh, X is cancelled. That's the important part here. Sine 90 equals 1. That's one of our landmarks on the unit circle because it's up there where Y is equal to 1. That's the maximum point for Y. Now part B was find the area of triangle ACD. Now this part's pretty easy actually. All you have to do is sub in the parts that we know into the area formula. This time the um, the X's don't seem to cancel. And you're like, oh no, I, I, you know, they should be canceling. Just leave it as is. The correct answer is actually with an X squared here. That's um, what the question is asking for. Because, you know, we can't find the area unless we know x. Otherwise, this could be any, you know, it's got infinite dimensions. Um, the area is not going to be constant for all of them. So, therefore, the area is going to have an element of x to it. All right. Oof, that concludes our trig and probability. Um, let's get into intro, or sorry, trig and second derivative. It's pretty heavy. Um, well done for sticking with me so far. We got about just over an hour left. Um, hopefully, probability will go a little bit quicker, just the intro part. All right, so what, what are we going to... This is probability section number one, intro probability. What are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about the binomial distribution and continuous random variables, okay? Firstly, binomial distribution. So, binomial distribution and Bernoulli sequence. Same diff. These guys are the same, all right? So, a Bernoulli sequence is... A sequence of repeated trials with the properties and these three things you do actually have to memorize so it's not often that you have to kind of uh, that a question will say oh explain 
you know, or what are two um, Bernoulli condition, conditions that have been met here? Here, you might actually be asked that. Sure. They might actually go, okay, um, is this a Bernoulli trial? And you have to actually justify why or why not. So firstly, um, each trial has to have two outcomes. So it's got to be success and failure. That doesn't mean that it's always like true or false. It can be like rolling a die. And is it a six or is it not a six? So even though there's six possible outcomes, and different probabilities associated with, with with all of them, we can like break it down into is it a six or is it not a six, okay? And this is how some students kind of get mixed up because they get confused and they're like, well, you know, way more than two options. Um, but if you're looking at one thing, it's it kind of like narrows down to kind of like an absolute where it's like yes or no, okay? Is it that thing or is it not that thing? And when you're answering questions like this, it's super duper important that you go, okay, this is a Bernoulli sequence. Let success be blah, blah, blah. Let's, and then you define all of those so that you can then plug it into um, the formula that's on the formula sheet under binomial probability. Because binomial, Bernoulli, potato, potato, they're very related. Um, obviously, we wouldn't say, oh, a binomial sequence was conducted. We'd say a Bernoulli sequence. Secondly, the probability for success of each trial is constant. Now, otherwise, it's not a trial. Think scientifically. So if the probability is fluctuating, that means it's unreliable. It's not very scientific because it's not very repeatable. So for it to be a trial, it has to be specifically repeatable. Okay? So probability needs to be constant. Otherwise, it gets way too complicated, way above your pay grade and my pay grade. Three trials are independent events. So if the first trial is a failure, that's not going to affect the second one. So, you know, soccer game, sure, let's say the probability of scoring a goal is like 0.2 or whatever. They score goals. Now, you, what you'll find is that those are actually not independent events. They're dependent events because the goalkeeper is going to be feeling down or because there's this human kind of emotional element. So you would probably argue that that's not a Bernoulli sequence. Yeah. So the number of successes of a Bernoulli sequence of a certain number of trials is called the binomial random variable. So as soon as we're like looking at success and failure across several triangles, uh, sorry, several trials, um, we, we call it a binomial random variable, and then we get some more interesting math happening. Um, and this is where that X comes in. So we can distribute it um, on a graph and we kind of give that value, um, the, we, we give it the name x. So, once again, prior knowledge, permutation and combination. You may have done this in year 10. If you do specialist, you've done this in year 11 and you're like, oh, you know, I don't, don't want to see this. And you don't really need to know it oh so well. Um, it's more about um, knowing. And as I recall, um, the Head Start lecture from... Uh, I want to say April, but I'm not thinking it's April. Maybe it's like June or something. Have a look at that. I think it was April because we went over it and I actually did the proper the proper triangle and said, okay, this is what you need to know. Go back to that. This is just recap at this point, okay? Um, if you do know your permutations and combinations, that's fine for you, but it's called Pascal's triangle. So just Google Pascal's triangle right now and then you should be able to know how to draw that up to like 10 levels or whatever. But it, you'll find it's very easily extrapolatable. Um, so we use this formula. You're probably thinking, you know, where on earth have we obtained this formula from? And this formula is on the formula sheet. But you do need to know what each of them mean. Okay? So big X is like the distribution. Remember these weird kind of definitions where it's like X equals X. It's like, what? Little x is the number. So the thing we're interested in. So if we want to find out whether, you know, what the probability of getting, um, you know, three rainy days out of 10, n would be 10, because that's the number of days, little x would be three. And then big x is like the variable. So big x equals little x, because little x is the specific point on that variable. I know, it's really confusing, right? Um, just know what to sub in is all you have to know. You don't have to have a brilliant understanding. Right, um, and then we can use this kind of combinatorics formula or combination. So this this thing here with the bracket, this is the combination. 
this is the Pascal's triangle. So, um, you know, knowing that N comes down, X goes across, so R and N. On Pascal's triangle, if we have this triangle, it's like 1, 1, 2, 1, and then we keep going. So we just fill in the 1s and then add up um, the two kind of like parents. We just add them up, okay? Um, make that triangle. We then look N. N's going down, so 0, 1, 2, 3. Then we have R or X here going across. Um, and then we work out what that specific number, because it's going to be a specific number, actually is, okay? Uh, you can also use your calculator. I know for my Teamspire, it was you went NCR, like you typed NCR bracket, you put the N number, then you went comma R. Use Google, look at your instruction guide, ask your teacher, do ChatGPT, work out how to do that because it is useful not having to do Pascal's triangle each time. Right, example. is, well, six times, there is one three, two fives, two threes are five threes, okay? So take five minutes to do this. Um, it is important, this is simple familiar content uh, still at this point. So it is important uh, that you know how to do this because it is really gonna be the foundation of you passing math methods, which which, which is definitely an achievement. Um, math methods is, is not easy, as, as you're well aware. Anyway, all right. So take a couple of minutes, have a go at that. Uh, here are the answers. So all you do is you sub into the formula, really annoying that the formula isn't here, apologies for that. Um, but all we do is sub in, so this first part would be the combinations thing. Um, and then we've got um, the probability, so it'll be like um, x minus this, or um, you know, the, if we go back to the formula, one minus p. P is the probability. Graphics calculators are your best friend, okay? You should do better on the tech exam if you've properly learnt how to use your graphics calculator, okay? Um, here, here's an example from the textbook uh, where they really go through this um, for, for FD Inspire. A non-CAS means it, it can't cheat and do derivatives and stuff like that for you. Um, rad for radians too by the way um and yeah binomial pdf you kind of just tab through it you never write it out and then you put in all the things um when you go through it it, it just pulls up with this like little thing it's like well how many trials are there and you fill that out that's why the tech exam like if you use your calculator properly it can become very easy now i can't i'm not going to speak to it too much just because other people have different calculators which means that you're gonna have entirely different processes for how to work this out. Please hop on YouTube, please know how to do, if you see something pop up and you're like, oh, I don't know how to do, um, calculate probability of a binomial sequence, um, binomial distribution, watch a YouTube video, it's all freely online and available. You are gonna save your, you are gonna get the best marks ever on that tech exam. Um, if you do this properly. All right. Um, this is for the Casio. Um, just follow those steps. I'm not going to speak through it because everyone has different calculators. All right. Further questions. So sometimes we're interested in not a discrete number. So like, have, you know, three days out of 10 are raining. But we're interested in more than three days out of 10 are raining. Okay. So we're not finding probability x equals 4, we're finding probability x is greater than 4. Or, you know, probability x is less than 8, etc. Um, now, we kind of have to do this by hand, to be honest. I'm not sure I forget. We're not, not going to talk about this very much, so um, it is important I talk about it now. A and that is, like, if we had um, probability that x is greater than 1, well, the probability that x is greater than 1 equals the probability, it equals one minus the probability that x equals one, okay? So you kind of use these absolutes where it's like, well, it's either one or it's not. If we're trying to find it x e more than one, don't add up our probability that x is two, x is three, etc. No, no, you would go, what is the probability that x equals one? You also have to do probability x equals zero. Um, to sum those up, or 
then minus them from 1, because remember all probability has got to equal uh, sum up to 1, and that's going to be your answer, okay? Yeah. Right, and then this is how we would then do that, so um, it's not PDF this time, it's CDF, this is exactly how I did in my calculator. You just sub in the values, you've got up, upper and lower, sub it in, bingo, there you go. Um, this is for Casio, this should cover most of you guys, just pause the video, have a look, more specific questions, let me know in the chat. Um, now this is a bit of an extensory type um, you know, it was in year 10, so you, of course you can have it assessed. And I'm pretty sure it's actually something you have to memorize. So the binomial distribution may be used in problems involving condition and probability. Now you need to recall that the probability of A, given event B has already occurred, equals the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. And then this little like intersection thingo is like and B. So if we had a Venn diagram, it's going to be that intersection point there, isn't it? Uh, you do need to memorize that. So write it on your data booklet. Um, you may not. Uh, I'm pretty sure you have to memorize it. But then again, I get confused, especially because specialists, they're more limited with what they give you guys. Um, so write it down anyway. Um, it's important to know the notation, unfortunately. So probability of A, given that B has already occurred, and then we divide by B there. All right. Here's an example. There is a 90% probability that any given person is right-handed. In a classroom of 26, find the probability that there are 20 right-handed students given that there are at least 12. Okay, so first of, like, spend a minute or two going over this. I'll give you five minutes. Pause it, set a timer, five minutes, have a crack. Um, here's the answer, though. Basically, we fill in what we know. So probability equals 0.9. So it's success failure, they're right-handed or they're not. So it is a binomial trial. N equals 26, because that's the number. Um, and then the question is, oh, we'll find the probability that X is um, 20, given that there's at least 12. So given that X is greater or equal to 12, what is the probability? So first, so we actually have to sub into the formula, which is, uh, directly into this formula, the given formula. So what is the prob so probability that um, x is 20 given x is greater than 12? Well, we sub in for a and b, so probability that x equals 20 and x is greater or equal to 12. Now, isn't that strange? Oh, probability x equals 20 and is greater or equal to 12. That greater or equal to 12 is irrelevant, isn't it? Because if x equals 20, um, that means that it's going to be greater or equal to 12. So that's actually just equal to the probability that x equals 20, isn't it? We then divide by the probability that x is greater or equal to 12. Um, now, they've skipped the substitution here, apologies, but you would then do a little scribble with your, bin you know, you'd either use your calculator, hopefully it's a te in the tech exam, or you would then, like, do your little scribble out the formula, work it out. All you do is a sub, sub in, p equals 0.9, n equals 26, and then the different value of x. This one would probably be text, just because it's a little bit too big, isn't it? It's a little bit too big, because you have to do probability x equals 1, x equals 2, etc., etc., to actually work out oh, what the probability of greater or equal to 12. Simplify it, and there we go. All right. To make predictions about a binomial distribution, we may wish to determine the expected value and variance for a given number of trials n with probability of success p. So these guys are just on the formula sheet. Um, expected value is ex, and that's just n times p, or this little mean symbol, okay? Um, and then variance, remembering that variance uh, equals um, the it equals the square root of standard deviation, I think, but we'll go over this in a bit too, um, and that kind of helps us when, like, if they ask standard deviation, you're like, oh, there's no formula. You use variance, and then you either square it or square root it, I forget. All right. Example question, take three minutes to do this. Um, pause the video. 
uh, find the mean and variance of the binomial random variables, okay? Um, all you do is you just sub in n equals that, b equals that, nothing too difficult there. Um, so often you may wish to know how many trials you need to conduct to be reasonably sure you'll get a certain number or range of desirable outcomes. Um, for instance, you have a binomial distribution with a probability of p equals 0.35 and you want to know how many trials are needed to make the probability of at least one success greater than 95 and it just gets so wordy right like the first time you try some of these questions it seems so wordy which is why volume 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 guys make sure you're doing your volume with questions because it does eventually make sense i promise you that everything will eventually make sense you just need to do volume maybe you slacked off during the year that's fine not too late even if you're slacking off in now you're doing the right thing watching this video and it's not too late to pull it, everything back from the brain so um this question is a bit harder, right? What we have to do is we have to break it down into things we know. So we want, um, we, we're going to have to sub in a 0.95. We know that. So the probability has to be 0.95. And x is going to be at least 1. All right? So here we see, what is the probability x is greater or equal to 1? And that is going to be greater or equal to 0.95. Now, we have to simplify into stuff that we can actually physically work out. So the probability that x is greater or equal to 1 is going to be um, equal to 1 minus the probability that x equals 0. Because we kind of think about it like a Venn diagram. It's like, well, if x is greater or equal to 1, the only other thing that's not greater or equal to 1 is 0. Okay? Now, now that we've got it in a discrete x equals this specific number form, what we can do is we can actually use our um, binomial sequence formula, which is just in the data booklet um, formula sheet. Sub that in, and now we have this weird like n thing. Um, so the variable that we're missing here is n. So when we break this down, we've got our combination. We can work that out, but we don't have n, okay? Or we don't have the combination either. Um, yeah, we wouldn't actually have the combination. Uh, oh, no, no, we do. Um, ooh, ooh, ooh. Now, I don't know if you guys did watch my video from April. I'm pretty sure it was April. Go back and have a look at that, because I remember that I specifically went, oh, crap, what do you need to know? I put a little red box, and it said there were the combination rules, the ones to memorize. And one of them was N, C, 0, because N, we don't know N. C, that's just combination. 0 is to r. You put r is 0, that whole thing is just going to equal 1, okay? That's why there's not this confusing NCR stuff. It actually simplifies nicely, okay? So, go back to that PowerPoint, go back to that video, watch it again, and you'll see this come up, because I did go over this in a little bit more detail. Like I said, this is probably more like of a revision as opposed to this is the first time you're seeing it. First time you're seeing it, I recommend watching that other video. Also, it'll help you with your unit three. Okay, now what we do is we just simplify minus the one away. Um, we got 0.65 equals 0.05, or the less than rather. Now, I would just use n solve at this point and then like work out in my head, okay, because of that less than sign, I know that it's either going to be greater or less than 6.954. Um, what is it actually going to be? Um, and you kind of use use a bit of logic to go, okay, well, um, it's it's likely going to be um, it's going to be greater than, okay. But um, if not, you can keep the nice notation. You only ever swap the the side for the direction. It's like a little crocodile head. You only you only swap that if you're like dividing by a negative or flipping flipping an n um, n you know, that's the only, like, if we, we can even do, like, functions like log across it, and it doesn't really affect it. Um, now, as we can see, n is greater than 6.954. That rounds up nicely to 7, and hey, presto, um, you know, we're a happy Larry. But suppose we have the same situation, you know, p equals 0.35, and we want the probability to be greater than 95, but we want at least two successes. It's fine. Okay, we sub in, greater, greater, less than two, um, sub that in, just this time, 
you know, when we actually worked it out. So the probability, so now we have to make this kind of bit of a logical jump because we don't want to do probability that x equals three, x equals four. We can't add up to far. We have to do the inverse of that, which is to go one minus 0.95 to give us 0.05, okay? Then we go, well, you know, if it's greater or equal to two, what numbers are not greater or equal to two? One and zero, okay? So all we do now is we just add up probability x equals zero, probability x equals one, sub that in. Obviously, this is extremely painful, right? You're not solving this, sorry. <laughs> um, so what you would do here is whack that in and solve and then go, okay, well, are we gonna have a less than for trials or is it gonna be greater than? And if you think pretty logically, you're going to go, well, trials is a minimum, right? We're looking for a minimum, so it's going to be greater than that point, okay? And so it's usually going to be a greater than sign. I can't think of any examples where it would not be right now. Uh, oh, sorry, I jumped the gun. Oh, what now? Um, now you would use um, the numerical solve function. Um, and they all your calculators will actually have this function built in. Um, it's n solve for um, oh gosh that that is an interesting formula. Um, of course you can do that. Um, now th I never learned this. I would actually have if I was given this. This is my thought. Or you would probably just sub it into n solve. Um, n solve comma n so the numerical solve, and then just work out in your head. Okay, trials is a minimum, so it's going to be greater than. Um, because we're going to have more trials than that. More trials is good, not less trials. Um, but you could, can also do this. Um, it is relatively low yield, though. You can just use n solve because that's or numerical solve because that is something that I really, really hope you have familiarity with. Uh, if not, ask in the chat. I'll I'll find a link for how to do it because you've been um, living under a rock and living it quite tough actually, not using n solve. All right. This is how you do it with Casio, um, but you can also f use the numerical solve function as well. All right, that's enough about binomial variables. We're now gonna move on to continuous random variables. So, so far we've kind of looked at discrete things. So discrete is like definite, not continuous. So where it's like success or failure, you know, there's only set options. So, you know, there's only going to be one success, two successes, three successes, four successes. We can't have 1.027896 successes. So continuous random variables are numbers that can have any value within a defined interval in a set of real numbers. That's a whole lot of gibberish. Basically, it's like we can't say for certain that it's exactly this because it's going to be sli slightly either side of it. So distance, for example, we can only measure up to like a micron or whatever, whatever the small measurement is. Um, but in reality, it's actually like way, way, way more detailed than that. Beyond what we can measure, okay? We know approximately it's here, but it's not exactly that. Nothing's ever been 10.000 to for infinity centimeters, nothing. So the things we measure, uh, they're, they're actually typically continuous, and, and some good examples are distance or time taken or height, okay? So data, you know, if we've collected data, we can approximate a continuous random variable. Um, and the key thing here is that we have these little bands of data, and it's in a histogram form. So because it's continuous, if you find the probability that it's at one specific point, nothing in the history of ever has been that one specific point, just because it's that detailed. It's such an abstract concept, I know, but it is important that you understand this. Probability that x equals x for a continuous random variable is zero, okay? But if you find two points and you're like, well, between one centimeter and two centimeters, then there's a definite probability that it's gonna lie in one to two centimeters, okay? So like this shaded area here is like a band of data. So as the sample size increases and the, the, the interval gets narrower, the histogram approaches a smooth curve. So then our approximation becomes more and more accurate. So, you know, if you're using a smaller and smaller interval, um, it's gonna be more accurate and less awkward and blocky, right? Now we call this a PDF, a PDF probability density function. Density, because it's like we're looking at these bands and the density of 
the probability in the so the probability density function would be the red line that's approximating this histogram okay because the histogram in itself isn't very accurate is it because we've got these bands and it's not very specific but if we model a curve based off that we can get really specific and extrapolate that to smaller and smaller intervals or more specific intervals or whatever the heck we want right um yeah so there's two probabilities of a probability density function now we'll write these guys down because they are 100 percent high yield um as in these may well be a question and i'm sure if you've done textbook questions before um, on this topic you've seen where you've had to use this so um the there's two main properties and you may have to explain why something's a probability density function i think i remember a past paper question on that actually um, now something's a probability density function if the probability is always positive so the function fx which is the pdf is always above zero okay that kind of makes sense but for it to be a probability density function between the minimum and maximum bounds the probability has to add up to one once again kind of makes sense however if you know we can actually use this property to solve for maximum minimum bounds or etc okay so we can actually solve for different variables by going okay well we know that between the whole thing the integral of that which is how we find probability um so the error remember the area under a curve to find the area under the curve remembering that the area under the curve here or the area of this histogram box that's the probability i know it's super abstract but we can then use that little integral integrate it between those two points and then we might have like a value a variable like t or whatever we can solve for that using the probability that the um sorry the using this kind of rule that between the minimum and maximum bounds all the probability adds up to 100. um so we kind of use that in some questions um here's a classic pdf um uh, as you know x would be the different measurement values whatever it is whether it's time or whatever um and you know it's never negative it's always positive and often we see it stepped out as like a um we see it stepped out where there's like two different equations and that's fine so long as they meet up and marry up really nicely that's a-okay -okay. so part a prove that f of x is a pdf um part b find the probability that x is less than one where x is given by the pdf i've got that i'll give you five minutes classic question this is still simple for me right okay first if we're going to prove it we need the two conditions the first one between the minimum and maximum bounds does it add up to one the maximum bound here is infinity because we're just going x is greater than zero okay so from zero to infinity um the zero part for the second part where it's less than zero we, we just really don't care about that so we do a bit of integration um have to call it this is a bit of a by pattern chain rule um we have to divide by the negative two um that gives us this this is weird notation that's basically saying oh well um this is our integrated function and we're now going to put it between two points which is zero and infinity um now you have to use a bit of logic and go well negative e to the power of a ridiculously large number that's negative is going to be ridiculously small i zero minus minus e to the power of zero anything to the power of zero is just one so what zero plus one is one so uh, it does add up to one so yes it's a pdf the other one um you'd probably write as a sentence um because it never dips below zero it is a pdf you would also have to write that part b find the probability that x is less than one where x is given by f of x we just sub in one here we that we're basically finding the bound the bound between the minimum and one because we don't care about below zero so we go zero one integrate sub in hey presto 0.86 um we can also use our graphics calculator remembering that if you are using your graphics calculator to graph something make sure you actually graph it just quickly do a sketch because otherwise you will lose marks that's what i was talking about before 
Um, now you can use just like here, this is the calculator I use. Um, oh dear, what have I done? Um, so you just literally do the integral. It only works for definite integrals. You can also use the nsol function to let, let's say you had like a variable a that you're solving for. You can actually use it instead of having to do some pretty hard algebra. Um, but yeah, we can map the free slope function, etc., etc. Um, make sure you contextualize this to your your calculator. Right. So, like with discrete random variables, we may wish to find the mean or expected value of a continuous random variable. Now, if we're doing that, we use this formula. Oh no, what's that formula? This is just on your data booklet. Once again, if you ever get lost, just go to the data booklet. More often than not, the formula you're looking for is just there. And if not, there will be a formula for the next logical step that you have to do before you then work it out, okay? So for example, standard deviation, you have to work out variance first, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we basically integrate it between the lower, the minimum and the maximum bounds. The only little cheeky modification we do is we multiply f of x, which is the PDF by x. Um, then um, if we're finding, Oh uh, yeah, and then if it's upper or lower bounds, which it often is, instead of being negative infinity and positive infinity, it's A and B. Remembering that with those infinities, you're gonna have to do a bit of logicking where you're like, okay, is this, you know, it's usually gonna be zero or one. Is it gonna be a ridiculously large number or a ridiculously small number? Um, which is gonna affect whether it's gonna be zero or one, okay? Um, all right, example question. Find the mean of a, con of a continuous random variable with its PDF given by f of x equals 0.5x between 0 and 2, and then otherwise, it just means like anywhere not 0 and 2, it's just going to be 0. I'll give you two minutes for this one. So we'll pause the video, take two minutes, set your timer. The answer is here, so we just go between 0 and 2, um, remembering that we got this cheeky little mod, which is we have to multiply the thing by x, well the students will just forget that. We do it between the upper and lower bounds, which is 0 and 2, because we don't care about the 0, it's irrelevant. Um, we integrate that function, it goes up to x over 3, x to the 3, we then divide it by 3 as well, so the 0.5 remains out of the front, but it's now divided by 3, and then we sub in between 0 and 2, that simplifies apparently to, um, actually it would actually simplify to uh, 4 on 3, just quickly in my head. Guess what? Your graphics calculator can do this too. Surprise, surprise. Your graphics calculator is your best friend. Not your dog, your graphics calculator. You're going to smash the tech active exam if you have done the volume of questions with your graphics calculator. If you don't know how to use a graphics calculator, you're screwing yourself over for nothing. It is so high yield. Looking, like knowing all the little tricks to do for your graphics calculator and being able to work with it, you're going to be in trouble if you don't know what you're doing with your graphics calculator. So we just define the function. It's a nice thing you can do, actually. Um, this is a re this is really really nice. I honestly wouldn't think of this. I would probably be lazy and do it, um, and I'll, I'll run out of time in an exam. That's why we we learn to use features like the define feature. Then we we learn how to use the actual integration feature. Right. This is how you do it with Casio. Um, right. Percentile. This, this is a little bit off syllabus, a little bit. It's it's conceptually out there. Um, I kind of didn't really have a strong concept of percentiles and quantiles, but kind of got a little bit lucky in the exam, I suppose, because it didn't come up. But I'm going to go with through it with you today because it is mentioned in the syllabus, unfortunately, um, which means that it, it is important that you do know what it is because they can test it, okay? So... Percentiles are like percentages, kind of. Um, so the equation below can be solved to find the qth percentile, p, of a distribution. <coughs> so, for example, we want the 75th percentile. We make q be 0.75, and then we solve for p that gives that 75th percentile. So the probability being, you know, we hit that 75%, we can then work out what point we hit the 75 at, if that makes sense. So, given the probability density function, 
um, f of x third e to the x3, um, find the value of x for which 90% of the values fall below it. Oh, sorry, you can have a, a minute to solve this one, set your time for a minute. If you don't, that's fine, like two or three minutes is okay as well. Um, in essence, you just have to recognize that you just have to sub it in, and then you just simplify, rearrange, and solve. Really nice question. Um, so, yeah, equals 0 0.9. When, did he, when does the probability equal 0 0.9 for 90%? You integrate, you sub in, um, an n solve, so a numerical solve function would be really useful here, but if you don't have that um, capability because it's a tech free exam, um, you would have to know how to rearrange your log and stuff like that. Um, if, if in doubt, just leave it, 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 like if you left it in the negative three times ln 0.1 form, that's A-OK -okay, um, if, if you're in a tech free exam. Right, this, this one is high yield, to be honest. Um, the median is, is something we, we, you do see come up a fair bit. It's like the, the interesting percentile, because we don't really care about 90% so much. So the median is the middle percentile. It's kind of like the average. It's a measure of central tendency. Um, so if it's in the middle, it's like at the halfway point, right? So that means the probability that x is above the median is 0.5. Probability that x is below the median is also 0.5. Do whichever one has a nice and easy upper or lower bound, if that makes sense. So um, don't make it hard for yourself. You know, if one of the bounds is infinity and you don't really know what you're doing there, first of all, watch a YouTube video for it, um, and it's either going to be zero or one, so just work out whether it's going to be incredibly big or incredibly large, incredibly small, um, but you might choose the one with the nice, um, like the lower bound is just one or something, but you do need to, so there's no formula that says, oh, probability x, you need to say let m be median, um, then you have to write a line that says probability x is greater than the median equals 0.5. Um, now, the reason they've written it here, this could confuse you, um, probability x is greater, less or equal to the median. This, it doesn't matter whether you have an equal champ band sign here, because the probability at the specific point is zero. Now, that's what I was talking about before. Because it's not discrete, it's continuous, nothing has ever been exactly bang on that point. Variance, um, variance is a measure of spread of a distribution about its mean and for a continuous random variable, uh, it, it's given by this. That first formula isn't useful to you. It's, it's this second one here, which is on your data booklet. So you first have to actually solve for the mean um, and then you got your lower and upper bounds. Now, um, this is interesting, this one. So don't worry about this computation or anything, like we don't really care about that. But this is interesting. Because it's 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 a yield guide. You'll get three three or so marks for actually sitting down and doing this, even though it's just like formulas. By having to do all those steps where you have to first work out the mean, it's got a high density of marks. Um, the mm, the other thing I will briefly talk about is this here. So this little guy here um, kind of looks a bit like a snail. Um, this is the standard deviation. So variance equals the, the square root of the standard deviation, or no, variance equals standard deviation squared, okay? So if, we, if we're if we given the variance, we have to take the square root of that to work out the standard deviation. Pause the video, write that one down in your formula sheet, because that is really important. Because a lot of students kind of miss marks that they deserve, and, and they honestly are very capable of, because they'll forget something like that, and they'll read a question that says standard deviation, they flick through the formula sheet, they can't find standard deviation, and so they give up, right? Even though they could have done the step for variance, and then even if they, you know, they, but um, because the question doesn't ask for variance, they just get zero, which is why these little marks are actually disproportionately weighted, in my opinion. You, if you hear standard deviation, think variance, okay? Think I gotta square root the variance, okay? Write that on your formula sheet. Converting between standard deviation and variance is very, very, very doable. So yeah, standard deviation equals the square root of variance. So you first find the variance, you then square root it, 
and then that is going to tell you what the value of the standard deviation is. All right, so example question. The amount of time customers need to wait in line at a cinema is given by f of x equals kx times 100 minus x squared, um, and then otherwise it's worth zero. So first, find the value of k. How are you going to do that? Maybe have a bit of a think. I did just talk about it just before. Um, B, find the mean of the distribution. C, find the standard deviation of the distribution. I'll give you five minutes for that one. I'm going to move on to the answer now. Um, so to find the value of k, we have to do that little trick, which I was actually talking about before um, for harder type applications, which is where we go, well, because it's a probability distribution, given that it's a probability distribution function, between the upper and no, it's between the lower and upper bound, the probability is just going to be one, yeah? So we can actually use that fact to our advantage and solve with this integral, and therefore solve for k. So a bit of algebra, um, remembering that k is not an x, it's just like, pretend it's just a number, so we kind of just ignore it when we do our integrations. Um, we don't really care about it until right at the end, okay? And then we solve for it. I, I don't really like this. Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. And then we, yeah. So we just leave it out the front. Um, do our standard integration. Solve for k using that one. And, and there we go. B, find the mean of the distribution. You're just substituting into a formula here. Nice and easy. Okay. Just subbing in. Sure, you'll make easy mistakes. Um, that's honestly where I lost all my marks is just simple mistakes. Just quite a lazy mathematician. Um, he's actually fine, but I just get lazy and make dumb mistakes. Um, C, find the standard deviation. Um, now, if you didn't from li just listen now, just now, you would have gone, oh, standard deviation, I'm going to look at the formula sheet. There's no standard deviation on here. You have to have memorized standard deviation equals the square root of the variance. So you first find the variance, you then take the square root of the variance, okay? Um, so if we're finding the variance, they've done this weird, weird, weird formula computationally. You don't need to know this, guys. Just use the formula on the formula sheet, honestly. Um, first, you have to work out the mean. Um, now, uh, it would actually be a complex unfamiliar question if this question was like, you know, they blanked out A and B and they were like, I'll oh, find the standard deviation. Because <clears throat> you would have to do steps A and B. So you can imagine that this is extrapolatable. It's the same skills each time, but you can have complex examples which are worth, you know, four or five marks, which don't require any further skills, which means that it's high yield. All right. Cumulative distribution functions, CDF. So a cumulative distribution function, CDF, gives the probability of getting a certain value X or less on the defined interval. So it's the PDF, but this time we're going, okay, it's getting that that value or less. So it's it's kind of weird. It's, it's another abstract concept that you kind of just become familiar with. It's they're never gonna um it's never it's not really so contextualized as in they're gonna do, the way it'll be worded to you is they'll directly say, Oh, calculate the cumulative distribution function and then find the probability that it's less than this, and then you just sub it in. It's essentially just a shortcut, right? So if the PDF is defined as f of x on an interval c to d, the cumulative density function is given by capital F of x, okay? Capital F of x, the probability that x is less or equal to x here. Now, we have to do this weird stuff where we add in this variable p. You're like, you know, where did p come from? Essentially, because we're interested in the x, we, we, we have to l make the old variable into a t, okay? Um, now, this is, once again, quite a classic question, just because it, it involves integration. Um, it's kind of a, a merging of these topics once again, okay? Now, this formula, I think you may have to memorize it, honestly. Uh, write it down for now. I can't remember, but I'm pretty sure you might actually have to memorize it. Um, so I will note also that c is the lower bound, so whatever the given lower bound is, x is the thing, so we're looking between between c and x, 
what is it? And what you'll find is that this whole thing here simplifies to like 10 times x or something, something like easy. The notation is weird, but when you physically go through and step it out and work it out, it makes a whole lot more sense. So let's get right into that. So given this PDF, find the cumulative density function of this distribution. Then find the probability that x is less or equal to 8, or greater or equal to 8. Then find the probability that 9 is greater or equal to, that x is greater or equal to 9, and less or equal to 12. So first, cumulative density function. All we do is just sub it into the formula. So we know, you've memorized that big boy formula there. All you do is you grab that formula and you sub in what you know. So we sub in the equation, so 5 divided by x squared, like I said before, the old x now becomes t, so we let it equal t, um, and then we just let, and then we look for our lower bound. So our lower bound is going to be five here. So we go from five up to x. So five divided by t squared. We solve this integral um, using a bit of a by power rule. Um, raised power by one means it's just negative one, but that's where our negative here comes from. Um, and then and then we sub in the we do the definite part of it, which is between 5 and x. Now, we have this really simple rule, which is 1 minus 5x, okay? Now, if we sub in, oh, what's the probability that, um, you know, x is equal, less than 5, we would just sub in 5 here. And look at that, 1 minus 5 and 5 equals 0. So, and, and that makes sense, right? Because x is greater or equal to 5, it's 0 elsewise. So you can see it checks out already. E, find the probability that x is less or equal to 8. Um, we're going to sub in, remember that the less or equal to, so the equal part, doesn't matter, could just be less than. Um, and that's because it's a continuous, um, continuous type deal. Uh, we don't really care about when it's smack, smack bang on because it's never going to be smack bang on. Okay. Um, sub it into the formula, so all we do is now sub in 8, and as you can see, you know, yes, we could have done it with a PDF, but it would have just been a bit longer and been a bit harder. And there we go, 0.375. Part C is between 9 and 12. To be honest, I would just use a PDF at this point. Because they didn't say use the CDF, but, um, I mean, you can do it. Uh, it is doable. Um, you essentially find... Um, the probability that x is less than 9, and you subtract that from the probability that x is less than 12. But I would just use a PDF and find the find the um, the interval, so I would just integrate between 9 and 12, to be honest. I, I wouldn't bother with any of this. This is a bit, this is a bit too, like, I look at that and I kind of feel a bit confused, so I would just use a PDF. Um, you're not going to get marked down for it um, if you, like, on last year's paper, there was a question 16 on paper 2 was, like, a specialist question, straight up. And, you know, I got full marks on that, um, or I assume I did. And I just used specialist. It was just a cheeky use sub. So they're not going to penalize you if you get the right answer and you show some level of working out. All right. Moving on to our final topic, and that is normal probability. Um, normal probability, I should have just labeled that at the bottom. Um, but this is the more like, it's the extension of probability. So we've done the introductory, like binomial, continuous, PDF. We're now going to talk about normal probability, which is potentially the most applicable because we see this appearing in nature and appearing in real life uh, a lot of the time. Okay, so normal distribution, we're not going to really have much of a discussion at the end of this. Um, if we have time, we will, but um, I've still got a few slides to go through. Normal distribution. So a general equation um, is not normal. Well, I don't know. These are both normal, but it's kind of like what scale do you go on? I will note that these formulas you don't need to know. That being said, if you see anything weird with like a square root of 2 pi and an e to the power of negative half, as you can see in both of these, I would probably like, you know, that's, that's good fodder for a multi-choice question where they can do like, you know, it's, it's not, not every student would have learnt it, so they can test the ones who have nice breadth of understanding, right? 
Um, so just for me, all I want you to know from here is that um, the formulas that actually describe this equation that describes the normal distribution, they've got an E in it, they've got a negative half up there, and they've got this weird square root 2 on pi. That's pretty iconic, like you will remember that. And then we've got two types. We've got the standard normal distribution, which is centered on a mean of zero with a standard deviation of one. And then we've got a general one where um, it's like centered on 100. That actually looks like the IQ one, to be honest. Um, but your calculators are going to do this, do all of this for you. And there's only three real numbers that you're going to have to memorize anyway. So it, it realistically has low tech free capability for questions that they can throw at you. It's more likely going to be in that tech active paper, or you're just going to have to use those three numbers that, that I mean, you, you have memorized. Um, if not, um, when I went through and I did the April lecture, I did like go, okay, I want this to be comprehensive, and I put it, I'm pretty sure it was April, but I put in absolutely, maybe it wasn't even, maybe it was July. May have been July. I'm now thinking it's July. I don't know if I did the April one. I don't think I did the April one. It's July. Look at the July one. Um, but I made sure I was like, okay, what did every, what did you need to know for probability? You definitely had to know um, those three numbers. So um, the, it was the like 68, 95, 99.7% rule. And what Z values to sub into those, you did have to memorize them. All right. So for a normally distributed variable x, the probability that x is less or equal to a is the probability that the z score is less or equal to a minus um, minus uh, the mean divided by the standard deviation, where z is the standard normal variable. So z is just like how many standard deviations left and right of the mean is it, okay? So a z score of 1 means that it's 1 standard deviation right of the mean. So in normally distributed data sets, we can say that 68% of values lie within one standard deviation, so the middle 68. 95% um, of variables values lie within two standard deviations, so 95%, and then 99.7% lie within three standard deviations of the mean. That's the 68, 95, 99.7% rule. Um, and then we, I'm not sure, I can't remember whether we do go over them today, but uh, the Z, you do need to look up the Z values for them. Just refer back to the July lecture for those. Um, I don't want to say it's slightly wrong for you to write it down. Um, I can ballpark it, but I don't want to say wrong, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so this is a formula you also have to memorize. Basically, we can work out Z scores, which are really useful. Um, by subbing in x's and the standard deviation. So we can use standardized values to determine how many standard deviations away from the mean a particular value is. They're acquired using this formula. So a positive z value um, indicates that the value is above the mean, whereas a negative z value would mean that it's below the mean. Um, we can also use norm CDF and PDF if you're using the p-inspired non-cast. Um, or alternatively, if you're Casio, um, essentially what you do is you just sub in upper and lower bounds, and hey presto, it tells you the probability. Otherwise, um, if you ever get a question in a tech free exam, um, on normal probability, it's probably going to be one of those scenarios where you draw it on the graph, and it's going to be um, some variation of the 68, 95, 99.7. Essentially, what you're going to do is you're just going to work out like the subtle differences, um, you know. For example, you know, you've got to work out what to include. You know, it's not always going to be, you know, if it's 99, you use that rule as your landmark. And then you go, well, if I'm looking for this point over here, we have to add up the 0 0.34 here, the 0 0.15, etc., etc. Okay, so we can use a graphics calculator to find normal probabilities. Okay. Um, you can also determine percentiles. From a normal, con um, normal distribution, I honestly would have used n solve here. I did not know you could do that. Oh no no yeah, I have used inverse norm before. Um, I lied. Um, these are like kind of like the z scores, I suppose. Um, make sure you know how to do this for your calculator. So norm probability. Here's an example. 
So in a year 12 math class, the percentage score of students in the exams is normally distributed with a mean of 73 and a standard deviation of 6. Um, a, find the probability that a student picked at random received less than 68. Find the probability that the student picked at random scored less than 70. Um, now we just work out how close it is to that mean and then we extrapolate from the standard deviation. Um, because they're not nice numbers, we are, this is a tech hacker question, by the way. Um, you have three minutes, have a go, pause the video. Uh, here is the answer. Essentially, we, we, we use uh, CDF to find between the interval, sub in the mean and the standard deviation, um, and we just use norm CDF for a t-inspire. Um, these are the different steps of the t-inspire. Um, I have to go a bit quickly now, but um, if you have any more questions, make sure you let me know in the chat. So basically what this means, having done the norm CDF, we've tapped all that, 0.0023 means that there's a 20.23% chance that it's a less than 68, and we define those upper and lower bounds, didn't we? B, find the probability that a student picked at random, scored less than 70%, given it is known they scored less than 80%. So this is a, a bit of a harder example, just because we have to use our conditional probability formula, but the requisite parts are all very doable, so don't be too worried about that. Um, just sub it into the formula and work it out bit by bit. Um, and there we go, 0.35, which is 35%. All right. In a factory which produces steel beams, the accepted limits for a particular batch of beams is 12.445 meters and 12.445 um, meters. That's not right. Let me just quickly check what they're actually talking about. Um, oh no, no, sorry. I'm, I am just absolutely bugging at this point. Uh, that's a that's a four and that's a five. So these are two different numbers. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, just sub in what you know, have a go at this one. This is a complex familiar example, but a classic question. So I would expect that you would have a good understanding um, of how to tackle a question like this. So assuming the mean length lengths are normally distributed, find the mean and standard deviation of the distribution. Take 10 minutes because it is a bit of a harder example. Okay, pause the video, have a go. Um, this is the answer here. So we like to really um, step out what we know and what we don't know. Um, so acceptable is between that and that. Um, essentially, undersized, so basically the probability that it's less than this is 0.04, and the probability that it's more than that is 0.04. Because normal distributions are symmetrical, we can actually add these two guys and average them to find the mean. Because the acceptable range is going to be like either side evenly, to the mean, so we can meet them in the middle. Um, we then use our Z, Z rule, um, importantly, um, because now we have to actually find, because if we read the question again, what are we finding? Mean and standard deviation. So classically with all of these questions, we have to use Z scores, which is really annoying, but that's because of how useful this formula here is, okay? And this formula is not given to you, which is why this will be a complex familiar, complex unfamiliar example, okay? So, um, first you have to fill out, you know, what we know, what we don't know. Okay, the probability it's less than that, 0.04, probability it's more than that. Also 0.04, um, and then we step it out with this formula, okay? Um, Oh yeah, and then we, oh, you know, using our standard rules, so you, there's kind of this underlying logic that you'll see again and again, it's like, well, um, we need it to be less than, for some, you know, to use our um, inverse norm formula, that's right, I have to remember that now, um, so we, we just swap it, um, now we can't just swap the Z so it's less than this, what we have to do is we actually have to um, minus 0.04 from 1 as well to give us 0.96, which is what, what you can see here. Um, now what we can do is we use inverse norm, we find the z value, which is then going to help us find, is going to let us set up two simultaneous equations. As you can see going down here, we've got two simultaneous equations, remember there's a divide by the standard deviation here, set up equals 1 equals 2, um, flip them over, um, you could do substitution, I'd probably do elimination just because you could flip 1, 
multiply them, one times two, and it's going to eliminate them nicely. Um, no, that's the inverse norm function on the t-inspire, um, and then these are the requisite steps. So we can then sub um, the mean equals 12.45 into one of the equations and solve for the standard deviation. So um, sub it in, now that we've um, eliminated that, so that's what they did down there, they solve for this, we can now also find the standard deviation, okay? Oh wait, well, you, you could um, use, so what I was saying is the generic strategy where it's like, um, but since we know the mean, we can actually just straight away sub it in, um, which means it's, it, you know, it's actually not that bad. Um, this might even be just simply familiar. Um, because otherwise, you know, we'd have to solve for both variables, and then at that point, you know, you can imagine that the difficulty is definitely certainly rising at that point. Um, but then we just sub it in. Too sweet. All right. So it's possible to use the normal distribution to approximate the binomial distribution. Recall that the shape of a binomial distribution depends on the number and the probability. So when n is large enough and p is not like either 0 or 1, we can actually approximate that it's normal. Now there are two rules, and that is that np, n times p is greater than 1, and that 1 times 1 take p is greater than 5. Now these are pretty sucky rules, basically you're just going to have to memorize them. Who knows, you might be asked a question where they're like, oh, well, is it normal? You would have to have memorized this formula to then be able to spit it out and go, oh yeah, it's normal because um, it fits those rules. Okay, so just memorize those two, np is greater than 5, um, and then 1 times 1 take p is greater than 5 as well. Specialist has a couple of more. When you approximate a binomial distribution using the normal distribution, we get the mean and standard deviation um, this way, um, because this is just the EX formula, so the expected value, these are just on the formula sheet, and then the standard deviation is the square root of the variance, this is the variance, so nothing too crazy here, don't bother writing that down, <coughs> and then we deal with that as any with any normal distribution. So, it is known that 30% of residents in a Brisbane electorate approve its current local member. If a thousand people were picked at random, approximate the probability that between 270 and 330 people approve of the local member. So first we have to do a bit of a bemuli um, and go, okay, let X be the number of people approve, approve being success, value being not approved. Um, we're assuming it's binomial, so it's Bernoulli trials, Bernoulli repeated trials, n equals 1,000, probability equals 0.3. And then we're going to use the normal to then solve for this next part. So pause the video, take five minutes, see if you can work it out. No problem if you can't. We're going to briefly go through it right now. So we can work out the mean. The mean is 300. That's also just halfway between 270 and 330. So once again, it checks out. Um, now we can work out the probability that it's between 270 and 330 um, using our z-scores. Okay. <coughs> So we can actually just nicely like swap in an, a Z instead of an X here, right? But to do that, we can't just leave it as, you know, we can't just swap it into here. We actually have to convert this to a Z score. So we have to do the weird X minus um, the mean divided by the standard deviation. But fortunately, we've already worked out all of those. Um, so we can just sub them in, wipe that into our calculator and actually work it out. This is a really nice, nicely worked answer because it just transitions cleanly from x's which we know that's the question to z's and the z as we can see is a more useful number given that we know the x and that we know um, the um, standard deviation alternatively we could also use our calculator and 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 this is the physical representation of the interval that we are looking at all right well that is actually doing us, and yeah, I, I honestly thought I had a couple more slides. But um, thank you for watching. Uh, good luck with the rest of your studies. You are approaching the end uh, of your study, a and it's honestly very tough. Um, I, you obviously have other subjects as well, um, and you're obviously very stressed. Like for me, 
you know, I'm thinking, how on earth am I going to get into medicine? Um, it's all obviously super competitive. Like for my course, there were 40 spots available and there's like 3,300 people that apply. Um, those are the kind of stats that you hear and you're like, oh my gosh, how on earth am I going to get in? Hopefully, you know, some of you have already got a planned pathway um, or are fairly confident, but all you can do is give it your best crack. And sometimes stuff won't go to plan and that's fine because there's always another pathway and another way to get in. Um, make sure you prioritize yourself. Um, I don't mean like don't study. I mean, get the stuff you want to done, but if you don't get 10 practice exams done in a day, uh, don't be too upset because everyone is human after all. Um, and you really can't talk down to yourself during this period. You are in holidays, which means you are in the prime time for study. So for methods specifically, it's all about doing volume of exams. I do actually genuinely recommend getting your Exonauts Plus portal um, because what you do is you just start with the topic test because those are probably like the, they, they can be a, bit, a little bit off syllabus sometimes or like the marks just won't quite marry up. But I honestly found the methods one to be a really nice um, kind of like gauge of where you're at. Do that first, then do the meat practice exams, um, do textbook tests, I suppose. Um, but then again, if you've gone over the textbook in some detail previously, uh, don't be too worried about that. Uh, finally, do your past papers um, and make sure you sit your past papers in exam conditions because you want to kind of see where you're at. So I got 48 out of 50 for my methods external. Um, which kind of translates to 96%. That being said, on all the past papers, you know, I was only scoring at low 90s at best. You know, you, you don't do as well on the, even the past papers you sit in the exam conditions, and that's because, well, when you mark it, you're probably going to be a little bit tough. Um, but also, you know, you, you, you're going to reach peak performance a bit later on, okay? Um, so, yeah, be really kind with yourself. Um, and make sure you have a nice breadth of understanding. Um, it's not about doing every single variant of questions, because guess what? QCAA is going to find one that you've never even thought of before. That, that is kind of just how it works, unfortunately. Um, it's more important that um, you develop your exam skills and develop the ability to be able to work out stuff, which sounds a bit voodoo, but essentially you need to have the ability um, to, you know, when you're sitting in the exam, you don't panic, because a lot of people hit the panic button emotionally, they're like, oh no, I don't know, you know, I'm stuffed, oh, you know, I'm going to fail this exam, and, and you get that, even the, even the best of us, you know, like chemistry external, for example, no, methods, and the last question was that really weird blog question, to date, have not met anyone else who's correctly solved that question, you had to like prove one thing equaled the other, now, I went through that, got it wrong, didn't work, crap, went through, did the rest of the paper, came back. Then I got it right. You had to do this like weird substituting the base thing. And it was the second go where I got it. And if and even Cam, like there was a um, oxidation of alcohols question where I just didn't get it. Um, and then I got it at the end. You have the eureka moment where you realize, because you've got to give yourself your brain time. That's why I actually recommend, and this is a bit controversial. I remain the only one that I've heard who tried this, but Basically, when you have your perusal, right, it's not, you know, it's pretty useless looking, like, don't even bother looking at multiple choice questions. Who cares? Yes, them if it means you can't, and it's worth nothing. Like, of course you have to do them, but your brain can be pretty dead and tired at that point when you do them. You know what point your brain can't be dead and tired at? When you reach question, you know, 20, 21, and it's like, you know, this is super hard question, and you can't, you know, your brain is exhausted by that point. Physically, it is. It's, for all intents here, like a muscle, okay? Metabolizes like a muscle, in fact. Um, so what I actually did is, in perusal, didn't bother with the easy ones. Like, I'd flick over them, not the multiple choice, but I'd flick over and be like, okay, that's binomial, and you just identify the probability type, or that's optimization, yeah, duh, like, I'm not going to... I'm not going to try and think through all that. Like, I can kind of vibe out what topic that is. Yeah, that's a win for me. Keep going. And then you move on to the um, the last question. I spent probably all of the 15 minutes perusal or 10 minutes just, like, staring at that last question, trying to work out what the heck I was going to do. I couldn't figure it all out. 
Because basically what that means is you're staring on that lot post and trying to work it out. And then they say, oh, you know, you can pick up these pens now and start writing. And you can grab your pen and you start on that last question. And honestly, I never would get the last question right straight away. And that's fine because I'm human. Everyone's human. But I would get, I would have at least gotten half those marks and part marks. And then I just missed the, like, change the base step. Crap, I don't know what I'm doing. Go back, finish the rest of the paper, come back at the 20 minute, rub it out, rub out the, you know, the, scribbles that I'd done to my last like valid line of working um and then and then fix it up from there that that's honestly what I recommend um is to do the last question first uh, and I did that with specialists you know I got 92 percent perfect because I did, went back to front I couldn't finish a paper in the time just because those last three questions are ridiculous and methods is similar right so you want to get those questions done and then gain momentum on the back end instead of like reaching doing the hardest thing when you're mo at your most tight. That's my perspective. You, you've got lots of time to still do these practice exams, so try one of them where you actually flip the order. Anyway, good luck with your studies, good luck with your pathways, um, and good luck with life. Um, make sure you reach out if you have any questions or you want any tutoring or anything like that. All right, thank you.